it's a, a pleasure to be talking again on the World Economic Forum. Uh, and as I've always felt, this is a great uh, uh, forum from where we can project our, uh, our views about our economy and talk to the investors. So let me just say, first of all, that uh, Pakistan had stabilized its economy uh, and was heading in the right direction when COVID hit us. And just like every country, uh, every country got badly hit by COVID because this was something unprecedented. And it was unprecedented because of the lockdown. Uh, there's no precedence of an economy being locked down, completely shut, uh, and, and the consequences of that uh, shutdown. That's really uh, what the world is coping with. So for us, it was not just a question of curtailing the virus, but it was also stopping our people dying from hunger. And we very quickly realized that when you lock down an economy, you have to uh, take care of those people who are daily wages, whose family depend on their earnings on a, on a daily basis or a weekly basis. And if you lock the economy down, uh, not only these people get affected, but secondly, those people you know, uh, uh, who, who are in the informal sector, like the, the, like the labor in the un Pakistan's labor, 80% is in the informal sector, so we have no record of them. So unlike the US where you could send money to their bank accounts, we couldn't do that. So we, we quickly realized that we could not impose a lockdown like the one imposed in Europe or in, in China. We realized that we had to go for a smart lockdown. In other words, have a, a, a spot the hot spots and, and, and lock them down, but do not really have a strict lockdown because you can't lock down hungry people. So that worked. We, we opened up our economy quicker than others. We opened up the, we never locked down the agriculture sector, which was basically rural. We opened up the construction sector, which was in, in the cities. And because it was mainly outdoor, there was no spread because opening up uh, the construction sector. And then we had a cash program where we uh, gave about 15 million families were given cash handouts. And it was one of the best programs. And that really saved us from the worst effects of the lockdown. And actually, because the people were with us, the public complied with our measures, we came out of it better, better than any other country. So we saved our economy from its worst effects. Also, we save people dying from uh, the, uh, the virus. Now, of course, we are hitting a second peak. And my worry right now is that, number one, because we succeeded so well, people are no longer that worried about uh, the virus anymore. And so we do not find that sort of level of compliance. And secondly, we do not know how long this uh, second wave, because it's in the winter, we don't know what this winter wave is going to be like. So, uh, you know, there's a bit of worry right now because we adjust, our cases are climbing up quite rapidly these days. The lessons we learned from uh, the first wave of COVID was that we in our country with our high levels of poverty and with a young population, high levels of unemployment, we cannot afford a lockdown where we lock down our businesses, where we lock down uh, the factories. So we have taken a policy decision that we are going to keep the, uh, the businesses and the, and the factories which employ people. We are not going to lock them down. We, will, we are going to only lock down the uh, non-essential, in other words, public gatherings and so on, where, where uh, the business, where our economy doesn't get hurt. Because we feel that the consequences of uh, hurting our economy on the people is going to be far greater than the, than the effects of the virus. Now, uh, the, the two challenges we faced, the two biggest challenges, one was the fiscal deficit when we came to power. It was the biggest ever fiscal deficit in our history. And second uh, was the current account deficit, the external deficit. And that also was a record a deficit. So the first year and a half really was stabilizing the economy to bring these deficits down. So cutting our expenditure, uh, improving governance, 
and then improving the tax collection uh, to uh, 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 remedy the fiscal imbalancing. And secondly was uh, cutting down on our imports and trying to stimulate uh, our exports, stimulate remittances into Pakistan because that forms a considerable part of our foreign exchange earning. Foreign direct investment, which was improving and fortunately is improving again. Uh, and, and then also clamp down on money laundering. Now, this is a big problem in the developing world where uh, uh, illegal, illicit flows of uh, money leave our uh, country to uh, offshore accounts and so on, this illegal uh, money. So we clamp down on that too. As a result, after 17 years, the last quarter, we had a current account surplus. This is after 17 years, so this was a big achievement and which reflected on the stability of our currency because we have, uh, our currency is now uh, floated uh, and it's on a uh, uh, market-based exchange rate. So our current currency stabilized, in fact, gained in the, in the last uh, few months. And our exports started uh, increasing because previously our exchange rate was uh, artificially kept high. As a result, the exports went down and we had the biggest trade gap of $40 billion uh, between import and exports. So our, our, uh, our import, uh, exports started improving. We also gave incentives to the ex export industry, to the industry in general. And so we are, we are seeing, uh, uh, compared to all the other countries who've been hit by COVID, Pakistan is that fortunate country where our stock exchange uh, uh, shows that people have, the business community has confidence in us. Our exchange rate reflects that. Uh, we have now, Cement sales are highest in our history, which means that the construction, uh, the incentives given to the construction sector have worked. So the construction sector is on the move, which means more employment. Our textile industry at the moment is running full. Uh, the, the hub of our, uh, the city, which, which is the hub of the textile industry, Faisalabad, they are short of labor right now. So the measures we took first stabilized and now are heading in the right direction. Of course, I say this because we do not now know uh, and we are praying that the second wave of COVID does not really um, make us uh, take those measures which affect this, uh, this uh, right trend, the country which is heading in the right direction. That CPAC is not exclusive to, to just China. CPAC is, first of all, it started with connectivity it was a transport, uh, a, a road network, which connected uh, various areas in Pakistan. Secondly, it was about power generation. We, need, we were short of power, so we needed power generation, you know, to uh, fuel the growing population and, and uh, the growth rate. So now the second phase of uh, CPEC is more than connectivity. It is special economic zones which we are opening up. Uh, and with special incentives there. It is about tech, uh, agriculture where we really need uh, help from China because their productivity in agriculture is much higher than in Pakistan. And um, uh, it's about uh, uh, also uh, these um, technology institutes which we want help from China because of uh, digital, digitalization of Pakistan improving our uh, you know, e-commerce. So we need uh, skilled labor for that, so, we, so that's also part of CPAC. But mainly it is about connectivity. It connects Pakistan to China, which is one of the biggest markets. It is also, uh, uh, you talked about the railway. First time in Pakistan's history, we are modernizing our railway. And it will completely revolutionize railway travel in Pakistan, which is called the ML1 and it connects uh, Karachi right up to Peshawar. And the next phase, we want to connect it right through Afghanistan to uh, Uzbekistan. So it will connect us to China. And also, we hope that it will, there will be an east-west. Unfortunately, with India right now, we have a problem. Uh, uh, and we hope that this will uh, change with a new government, which is a moderate government, we have, uh, where we can resume normal relationship with India. But with Iran, if uh, sanctions are lifted there, we then have a north to south, east to west connectivity, and Pakistan's special strategic location connects it to, to the biggest two world, biggest markets, as well as the energy corridor. 
So we are really very well placed and CPAC is a great opportunity to now move forward from here. And as I said, it's not exclusive to China. Anyone can uh, become part of the CPAC. The key for us right now is Afghanistan. Uh, it's after a long time that there is a prospect of peace. For some reason, there, was, there were attempts for a military solution. And here's someone who kept saying that there was never going to be a military solution. Finally, the peace talk started, and Pakistan played a huge part in getting the Amer Americans and the Taliban to sit on a table. And then it played another very difficult w to get an intra-Afghan dialogue going. Now, unfortunately, there is a, the level of violence is growing in Af Afghanistan. And this is of concern to us, because we believe that peace in Afghanistan has huge dividends, first of all, to the people of Afghanistan. But then to people of Pakistan, be, it connects us right up to Central Asia. And as you quite rightly said, Central Asia has this huge untapped potential, which is, uh, you know, which is, uh, which will be of great benefit to us and to Central Asia if they can uh, connect right down. They are landlocked, and they can, through Gawadar, they can be connected uh, to the world. Uh, so, the the great hope here is that there is this, these talks succeed, and there is peace in Afghanistan. And apart from anything else, the tribal belt of Pakistan, the, the strip of land adjoining uh, 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 Pakistan and, uh, and Afghanistan, they were devastated by the war on terror. And the best way to rehabilitate and to uh, uh, give employment to the people there is if there is peace in Afghanistan and these, the tribal, the, the adjoining areas will benefit the most from trading and connectivity. If someone asked me what was uh, President Trump's uh, greatest uh, achievement, for me it, it is this uh, the resumption of the uh, uh, of uh, Afghan peace process. I feel that it was a great achievement of his because he literally forced this peace process to take place. And uh, you know, uh, the the fact that after so many years there, are, there there's a dialogue going on, no matter how difficult, and it was always going to be difficult. The longer the conflict, the harder it is to uh, bridge that divide which that conflict creates. So I, I feel that uh, President Trump uh, did a great job here. And, I, and, I, and I'm convinced that uh, 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 President-elect Biden is not going to reverse this because there is no other solution. I mean, uh, there, there is only one way forward. You can't have a conflict going on for 19 years and no result and expect that you keep doing the same thing over and over again, and you expect a result in the next 19 years. So therefore, I think everyone uh, will be trying to push this peace process. Let me just say one thing. Well, that, yes, you know, we see our government as a facilitator, you know, to facilitate the private sector. Uh, we, we believe that, you know, the government's job is not to actually uh, come into business, except in certain crucial areas. But in, in, in this field, we really believe that it's the private sector that needs to be encouraged and facilitated. So uh, the answer is yes, this, this is the future, uh, public-private uh, partnership. And the sectors you mentioned are extremely important, agriculture, uh, governance system, because uh, the efficiency in governance system comes with e-governance. And we have actually set ourselves deadline when we want all our government uh, departments to be on, um, uh, you know, e-government e rather than the old uh, 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 paper pushing. Pakistan's retail uh, sale is almost around 125 to 130 billion dollars. It's a huge market, 220 million people, young population. Uh, so, uh, more than me telling you, I would like you to uh, tell Dr. Hafiz what are the sort of things you want us to do? You know, how do we uh, encourage people like you? Because, uh, and you mentioned groceries. This is something which really we have been uh, uh, working on in the past four or five months because of uh, our food inflation. And we want somehow to uh, encourage wholesale or where uh, the retail can get directly stuff from the farmers so that we can, uh, the consumers can get low price uh, groceries. 
and this is this has been a discussion going on within our government but we would love you to give your uh, point of view and uh, dr hafiz since he heads the committee which uh, which looks at food inflation on a weekly basis uh, you know he knows all about the efforts we are trying to make to to somehow bring down the cost of uh, vegetables and groceries so we would really love you to uh, give your uh, input in this we want three things number one we want the actual farmers to get uh, paid more because at the moment they do not get paid much the middleman gets uh, most of the money so the one who works hard number one we want him to get paid more and secondly we want the consumers to get a lower price and thirdly we would want our products to be graded problem is this is yes. uh, you know pakistan has some of the best fruits and vegetables in the world problem is because we don't grade them uh, we cannot uh, market them we can't export them as well so you know you have that expertise so we would love to uh, uh, have that uh, knowledge from you and this government would really encourage um, uh, any uh, automobile uh, investors in this country who and especially who can export from pakistan so who can uh, you know manufacture the automobiles here and then export and we have uh, given a series of incentives for them and in fact uh, th there has been a growth post covert there has been a growth in the sales of uh, 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 um, uh, motor cars in pakistan and secondly we have also just come up with a uh, electric vehicle policy so that also we are encouraging right now bearing in mind our uh, uh, this uh, this government is very conscious of the environment and the global warming and climate change we have taken various steps and one of them is that we are now encouraging uh, electric vehicles to be to be made in pakistan what 28 paces in the ease of doing business we've uh, improved uh, in one year i can just say one thing that uh, in pakistan in 60s we were uh, a model for the developing world Pakistan was industrializing quicker than any other country in, in Asia. And Pakistan was uh, considered, was given example of, of, of success. Unfortunately, 70s, we went the other way. We became more a socialist country. And so profit making almost became a crime at one point, which is sadly what happened in, the, in, the, in those days of, uh, you know, where there were two camps, capitalism and communism. So we went that way in 70s, and that choked our industrial development. This is the first government in Pakistan since 60s, which has made it a point that we want to make, make profit making uh, 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 easy for people. So we want to uh, do everything to make it easy for investors to make profit in Pakistan. And so as a result, we are trying to remove all the impediments that were in the, in the way of profit making. So that means dealing with regulations, with red tape, um, all the problems we, 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 are, we were stuck with. And so we are moving in that direction. And it is reflected now, and especially in our construction sector, because that's one sector where 30 industries are attached to it. So once that gets going, the other 30 industries all start moving up. And that is where it has taken us almost a year to remove all the impediments that were in the way of the construction sector. And that's what we are trying to do in the small and medium industry. And Dr. Hafiz will tell you in the capital markets what, uh, all the reforms that they're trying to make. So the, 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 this Pakistan, the current Pakistan of, uh, of the 20, 220s, is all about creating wealth by, uh, by industrializing, by making it easy for industrialists and then using that wealth to lift our people out of poverty and it's actually a model which china followed our biggest problem right now in pakistan has been very expensive energy we unfortunately the sort of uh, uh, power generation contracts we signed in the past uh, the sort of uh, the, the the cost of that generation is unfortunately so high that we are almost 25% more expensive, producing more expensive energy in Pakistan compared to our competitors like Bangladesh and India. And, uh, and I mean 25% more expensive energy to industry. And therefore, it has actually impeded our industrialization, 
which means wealth creation and which means uh, our inability to sort of raise people out of poverty or even to pay our debts. So therefore, our, our biggest challenge has been now to provide affordable energy to our industry.